My flags, we begin to gear up. To get out of the crowd, Rick decides to suit up on the bow. Note that for warmth and comfort, the Dive Rec Valley team chooses to utilize dry suits. We also travel with Velcro double bands that allow us to combine an assortment of tanks into doubles for an adequate air supply for the planned duration of our working dives. After we each don our dry suits and double tank rigs, we're ready to go. Before rolling in, I check the settings and focus on my camera. We're now ready and eager to jump into the crystal clear, translucent fresh water. One at a time, we roll off the sea hunt and are pulled up current to the mooring line. Stay tuned. When Dive Wreck Valley returns, we'll be descending to explore the wreck of the freighter Keystorm, the three-masted schooner AE Vickery, and the side-wheel steamer Islander. We to find excellent conditions and spectacular visibility today. Today, we're anchored into the wreck's bow. Divers will reach the top of her bow in only 20 feet of water. Rick takes a moment to look into the Keystorm's massive portside hawser hole. The hawser is what the ship's anchor chain would pass through. Divers can actually look through the hawser hole to the Keystorm's main deck. Only a short distance away is the anchor's powerful winch, still mounted firmly onto her deck. Just behind her winch is the skeletal remains of the Keystorm's pilot house. Local divers have attached a small fake bell to the starboard side. And Rick takes a minute to ring the bell before entering the big ship. The Keystorm was built in 1908 in Wellsend, England. She was 256 feet long and had a 43 foot beam. On October 12, 1912, while sailing in a dense fog and carrying 22,030 tons of coal, she struck Outer Skoll Island Shoal. The big ship went down in minutes and now sits on her starboard side. Fortunately, there were no fatalities from the disaster. Inside the wreck's pilot house, Rick has found some china. These are not, however, artifacts from the wreck, but were put here by some local diver with a good sense of humor. Please remember that penetration into any overhead environment should only be done by those with the proper equipment, training, and experience. Even on clear water wrecks like the Keystorm, silt is easily kicked up, reducing visibility greatly. As we continue to swim astern, we find many recognizable landmarks, including this double-posted bowler bit. Divers should take note of the current while diving this wreck. It is highly recommended to anchor into the down current end and swim up current during their exploration. This way, divers will not have to fight against the current when returning to the dive boat's anchor line. While Rick Schwartz and I continue to video the forward half of the wreck, Joe and Fred made the swim up current to photograph her stern. Along the way, they also found many recognizable landmarks, like this air vent, once used to deliver air to the Keystorm's powerful engine and these doghouse skylight windows. The engine of this wreck, like many Great Lake freighters, is located in her stern. Joe's job on today's dive is to take still photos of the wreck, documenting her present condition for a series of articles and a future book project. I was amazed at the thickness of the wood used on this stern deck hatch. Only a short distance away, divers will find the Keystorm's propeller still in place and 115 feet of water. Meanwhile, Rick is cruising into one of the massive cargo holds. The Keystorm has four cargo holds, which were used to transport her cargo of coal. Near her forward cargo hold, one of her two masts are still in place. This mast still has its boom and pulley in place. The mast sticks out into mid-water, extending past the extent of our visibility. Although massive, the excellent visibility and fact that the wreck remains intact makes navigation around the Keystorm rather simple. The wreck is, however, considered a novice to advanced dive due to the current, which at times can be quite strong. As our limited bottom time quickly begins to run low, we start to slowly make our way back towards the wreck's bow. Swimming along the bottom of her starboard side, Rick finds a salt shaker. It's not certain whether this piece is from the wreck or just another recent addition. From sand level, the pilot house is silhouetted, providing one of the best photo opportunities on the site. Joe takes advantage of the silhouette and takes some still photos before ascending. Rick follows the slope of rocks known as Outer Scow Island Shoal. It was this shoal that caused the Keystorm to sink over 85 years earlier. 
it's now time to make our way back to the dive boat's mooring line and begin our slow ascent and safety decompression hang. Visibility here has been better than we had imagined. After a 10 minute hang and an easy cruise on the sea hunt, it won't be long before we're back in the water. Let's now take a look at the wreck of the A.E. Vickery. For this dive, we're anchored in shallow water and we'll follow a line which leads from the cliff wall out into the channel. We can't anchor in the shipping lane, so tying directly into the wreck is out of the question. The current line will, however, lead us directly to the A.E. Vickery, an intact wood-hulled, three-masted schooner. The Vickery was built in 1861 and originally launched as the J.B. Penfield. She was 136 feet long and had a 26-foot beam. The Vickery was sunk on August 17, 1889, as it entered American Narrows. At the time, she was carrying 21,000 bushels of corn. The only problem with diving the Vickery is the almost constant severe current. Due to this current, this dive should be considered one of the most advanced in the area. This little wreck sits upright and intact. The Vickery's bow sits in 60 feet of water and her stern is in 110 feet. Divers can swim into her cargo hold, which is one way of avoiding the heavy current. Inside, divers will find a silt-covered floor, but being careful not to kick up the silt, can swim aft and exit from a variety of deck hatches. One of the key landmarks on this wreck is a wooden cleat mounted on her deck. As Captain Steve and Fred emerge from her interior and start to make their way forward against the current, Steve takes note of the zebra mussels that have infiltrated the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River. These little mussels are partly responsible for the great visibility by filtering the water. However, they've also wreaked havoc on the local ecosystem. As Fred looks at the wreck's bow-mounted capstan and Samson post, Steve pulls himself along the wreck's deck rail, which runs completely around this intact wood wreck. Steve now drops over the wreck's starboard side and follows her anchor chain towards the sand. The Vickery's anchor chain was cut and her anchor salvaged years earlier. From sand level, the A.E. Vickery's bow looks massive. Over the years, most of our explorations have been in the saltwater ocean environment. In the ocean, most wood hulled shallow water wrecks deteriorate quickly, not only due to tornadoes, wood-eating worms, but also from the constant pounding of winter storms. Diving the Vickery is a nice change. It's almost a storybook shipwreck, sitting upright and intact in clear water. The only problem is the constant current, which has made navigating around her difficult. It's now time to start our ascent. In this case, we just descend back to our main deck, then follow the line which leads from our port side over to the Sea Hunt's mooring. Having explored the remains of two wrecks, both sitting in strong currents, we now decide on an easier late afternoon dive. The next wreck we'll visit is the side wheel steamer Islander. This wreck is accessible by boat or as a beach dive. From the beach, access is easy, parking is available, and it's only a 50-foot swim to the wreck. The Islander was built in 1871 in Rochester. She was 125 feet long, had a 20-foot beam, and displaced 118 gross tons. The Islander, which was a mail and passenger carrier, caught fire and sank on September 16, 1909. This wreck, which sits in 20 to 60 feet of water, would be great for a beginner dive or even a certification class. With only a mild current, the wreck sits on a sloping bottom parallel to shore. Advanced divers also find this wreck to be enjoyable by digging for artifacts. Divers can find an assortment of silverware and bottles, but must be willing to spend some time fanning the bottom. Diver Bruce Raiden looks at the Islander's engine. Meanwhile, I wiggle through a small hole and swim forward inside her skeletal remains. As Bruce continues to look over the Islander's stern, Captain Steve Belinder is utilizing wireless comm gear to communicate to the surface as we explore this fascinating little shipwreck. Meanwhile, I'm still making my way towards her bow. This partially buried door is still relatively easy to squeeze through. The 
Highlander's bow, although broken down and deteriorated, is still easily recognizable. Now at the very tip of her bow, I find another small hole to exit the wreck. This wreck was actually one of the most enjoyable dives we've done during our four-day trip to the Thousand Islands. We filmed and photographed the wreck on one dive, and on another dug for bottles and silverware. This is just a small sample of the type of artifacts that can be found by those willing to spend their time digging in her debris field. Look closely, and you can see St. Lawrence Steamboat Company, abbreviated on this fork's handle. It seems that the Thousand Islands has something for almost everyone. If you're looking for a family vacation destination with an assortment of shipwrecks and good visibility, the St. Lawrence, Thousand Islands, might just be the perfect choice. 668-2658. Dive Wreck Valley is brought to you by the Clayton Chamber of Commerce, Kay's Motel, Hunt's Dive Shop, and the Beneath the Sea Symposium. After a full day of diving, it's time to climb back aboard the Sea Hunt and plan for our next day's adventure. I would highly recommend Clayton to any divers traveling to the upstate New York area. Clayton offers excellent access to the St. Lawrence River's Thousand Island shipwrecks. This area could also be called the Northern Caribbean. The water was surprisingly warm and visibility fantastic. As we cruise back, we're already planning for our next wreck diving adventure and when we can return to the Thousand Islands. I would like to especially thank Captain Mo Hunt for his hospitality. For additional information on diving the Thousand